But here's what I do know. Fear will corrode us from the inside out if we're not careful. I also know that our mental, emotional, and physical health are really important in times like these in dealing with crises. So it's important that we find ways to allow the fear to be there, allow ourselves to stay informed about what's going on out there, but also not let the fear and the agitation control us, take us over, because that wears us out. It wears us out mentally, emotionally, ultimately physically, and that does not help us or the loved ones around us in our communities that depend upon us. So we've got to find a way to engage with this in a skillful, useful way. We've got to find a way to feed our good wolf when it comes to dealing with this circumstance. And that's kind of what I'd like to spend just a couple minutes talking about in this short episode. Several different ideas came to mind for me when I started working on thinking about wanting to say something brief here about all this. And And the first that came to mind was uh, the author Mark Nepo, uh, who we interviewed recently. That episode will be coming out. But um, he and I were talking, and he had a line that really stuck with me that said, we become addicted to the noise of things falling apart. And he actually, that line was written outside of this context, but in this context, it makes a lot of sense. We are uh, very much addicted to the noise of things falling apart in general. And in this particular circumstance, many of us are addicted to watching what's happening. I find myself turning to Twitter and the news way, way, way more than I normally do. And again, some of that is good, but a lot of it's not. And what I am is I notice myself sort of becoming addicted to the news cycle, to the spin, to the speed, to the urgency, to the, the whole thing. And that, I can tell, is it good for my insides? You know, the other thing that he said about this, we become addicted to the noise of things falling apart. And I love this. He said, but things are also always coming together. Things are always falling apart. That's the nature of things. But things are also always coming together. It's just that those coming together moments are a lot more quiet. And we have to actually make a point of turning towards them, of turning towards something deeper. And that's really, I think, the the first pointer I would give here is that what we want to do is we want to continue to turn towards what's deeper in us, what's deeper in our spiritual practice, what's deeper in our personal practice, what's deeper in our lives, right? A lot of us are getting time to spend more time with the people in our lives that we love than we normally do. And we could look at this as a burden, And for a lot of us, it's a surprise and it's a change. But this is also an opportunity to have the people we love closer to us, to spend more time with them and more care on them. And so how can we find a way to nurture that, enjoy that, and appreciate that? In any sort of crisis, there's the the classic, I don't even know if it's true, that the Chinese character for crisis is opportunity. I don't know if it's true or not, right? But in any situation, there are opportunities, and there are opportunities in this situation. And one of the most obvious is the time that we can spend together uh, that we don't normally have, the chance to perhaps slow down just a little bit and spend a little bit more time together. So that's one pointer. But in general, to turn more towards those deeper underlying parts of life that are coming together that are beautiful and wonderful that simply don't get our attention because the clamoring noise of everything falling apart shuns them out. Where can we turn to those more in this time? The other idea that I think is really important is we had the guest Linda Graham on the show and she talks about resilience a lot and one of the things that she says is how you respond to the issue is the issue. So for us, how we respond to what's happening right now is the issue for each of us. Personally, our individual response is the most pressing issue for each of us, right? And this gets to where we put in our attention. What are we paying attention to? And so it made me also think of Stephen Covey's idea of the circle of influence versus the circle of concern. And what Covey basically says, and you have to imagine two circles, there's a big circle, that's our circle of concern, and then inside of it is a smaller circle, which is our circle of influence. Circle of concern are all the things that we care about, that we worry about, right? So the news, the coronavirus, or the response to it, all of that, that all falls in the circle of concern. And we do need to be concerned, and we do need to spend a little bit of time there. But the smaller circle is our circle of influence. This is what we can actually do something about, right? And what Covey says is the more time we spend in our circle of 
concern, but not inside our circle of influence, our circle of influence actually shrinks. And conversely, the more time we spend in our circle of influence, the larger it grows. And so in this case, I think it's really worth looking at where are we spending our time. If we're spending all our time engaging in the news and the crisis beyond what's instructive or helpful, then we're in our circle of concern. And again, I'm not here to tell you how much that is. You have to find out for yourself. And, but I think that idea of how much of this is instructive and how much of it is it helpful, those are useful ways of saying, okay, I've got what I need from there. Now let me move back into my circle of influence, right? And in the circle of influence are all the ways that we can take care of ourselves and take care of our loved ones. Really, our mental, physical, and emotional health is really important. So the fundamentals of self-care here are very valuable. Are we eating healthily? Are we getting a good night's sleep? Are we exercising? Are we meditating? Are we seeking wisdom from sources that we trust and know? So when we do that, we're strengthening the pillars that will see us through this storm. And the other thing is that fear has an energy to it, right? And so by taking positive action, we actually channel that energy in a productive direction instead of allowing it to sort of twist us up inside. And so I want to just give a couple of short practices that I think might help us in this time. And so one thing that's important to know, I think, is that fear is fed by our thoughts, but we feel it in our bodies, right? And so what we want to do is it can be helpful to drop down out of the thinking mind into our feeling senses. It's a way of allowing that fear to work with it directly and a little bit more skillfully. And so there are two practices that I'd like to bring forth for you to contemplate. And the first is from another recent podcast episode with the guest Fleet Mall, who introduced us to the practice of straw breathing. And straw breathing is just a type of breathing. One thing that we know is that when our exhalation is longer than our inhalation, it tends to stimulate our parasympathetic nervous system. And that becomes a signal to our brain that we're not in a fight or flight or freeze state of danger and our limbic system can relax. So any type of breathing that is going to allow the exhalation to be longer than our inhalation is going to help in this. And straw breathing is just a type of of breathing, of doing that. And in essence, you can practice it with or without a straw. If you have a straw, it's great. But the idea is you breathe in normally, and then you exhale in a slow, controlled manner as if you're breathing through a straw. You can play with different counting. So for example, I might do an in-breath of four, hold for eight, out-breath of 12 through the straw, or in-breath of four, hold for four, out-breath of eight. Right. They're just different. You got to find the pattern that sort of works for you. There isn't a one size fits all, particularly because everybody has different capabilities in breathing. But you want your out breath to be longer than your in breath is the basics of it. And by doing it slowly, rhythmically, counting it and breathing out through the pursed lips like you have a straw, it helps to slow our fear response. It helps us to relax. So I'd encourage you to try some straw breathing or other ways of deep breathing. It's a very good fear response. The thing about it is most of us tend to try it when we're really highly stimulated and we're like, all right, I'll take a couple deep breaths and the world doesn't change overnight from taking two deep breaths and we abandon the practice. So this is a practice that you can do over time and we actually get better at doing the more we do it. So I'd encourage you to just work it in. I've started doing this straw breathing at the beginning of my meditation practice because what I find it does is it actually settles me down in general. And so I might do uh, 20, say, uh, cycles of that breathing in for four holding for eight, out for 12. I might do 20 cycles of that before I drop into meditation.